My name is Scott Kenoki. I'm an agent over in Benson County. I've uh, been there quite a while. And two years ago, I took a trip to Nebraska. Uh, I was sponsored by the South, you know, the uh, Soybean Council. And a bunch of agents went to some private industry and things. And we, we learned and saw what a real monster is down there. They didn't even differentiate between Palmer Amaranth and uh, water hemp. Yeah, but they were just all pigweed. Yeah, and I'll show you some pictures. But anyway, we thought we had some time before we're going to get up here and, and raise some cane. And uh, many of you don't have it yet. It's important you know what it looks like. And if you find something odd out in your fields, be sure to get a hold of your agronomist, your extension agent, or weed scientist or something, and make sure you get a handle on it, try to minimize the seed production. And you'll see why as I go here. Um, the only reason I'm showing this, this is a water hemp seedling. Not that you're going to probably be out there identifying it when it's this small, but this is a stage of growth that you want to control it. You know, Liberty's got a label, you want to control this at two inches tall. And some of the other products, you know, three, four inches, we get up much above that and we run into some real, real problems just because it's such a tough customer. The, I want you to notice the, the linear shape of the leaf. It's kind of long and narrow and it's kind of got a sheen to it. Uh, and here's a, a shot of, of water hemp, both a male and female plant. The male plant is on the right and that produces the pollen. These are cross pollinated. So with that comes genetic diversity that changes very easily from plant to plant. It's not like a plant that pollinates itself and minimizes any uh, change in, in its genetic makeup. Uh, the one on the left there is the, uh, the female. A lot of times it'll kind of have a brown hue to it or a, a reddish. It's not as robust. But that's the one that makes the seeds. And here's our nemesis. Palmer amaranth, got egg-shaped leaves, and there again, you want to get it when it's small. These babies are native to the Sonora Desert and can grow two to three inches a day. Uh, and when you want to control them at two to three inches, what happens when you get six days of rain out or wind and you can't get to them? It, it, it creates some real challenges, and that's why the pre-emergence are extremely important. And here's some more pictures of uh, Palmer. This, these are some shots taken down in Nebraska. But sometimes, not always, they'll have a watermark on the leaf, but one of the key identifying characteristics is this long petiole or leaf, leaf stem. And you can see the size of them. Some of them, they were as big around as pop cans. And I'll talk about how competitive they are with soybeans and corn here in a little bit, but they are prolific seed producers, uh, half a million seeds. Uh, not a real big deal for these guys to make in, in one season. Another identifying characteristic on the, uh, the palmer uh, in these leaf axles, if you were to grab it on the female, it'll about draw blood on you. Uh, so that's another way to identify. One thing I will say, both palmer, amaranth, and water hemp do not have any hairs at all. Whereas your red rip pigweed, it's going to be hairier than an old dog. And there's another amaranth species called Powell. Uh, sometimes it has some hairs up towards the growing point. But it can be uh, kind of difficult to distinguish, and you'll see some of the seed heads in some of the future pictures. Uh, both water hemp and Powell have quite long seed seed structures, whereas, of course, you know what red red pigweed, little short, stubby seed heads, but a lot of them. Uh, here's just another shot. The, the male is on the bottom. Now, this is Palmer seed head. If you were to, like, cat's tail, rub your hand across it, on the male, it's going to be soft as a kitty's tail. But you grab a hold of that female one, and it, you're going to, it's going to bite back a little bit. So that's one of the characteristics that it's got some uh, pokies on it. There's just just some more seed heads. Uh, th those are Benson County. We grew those right in our own county here a few years ago. So I, yeah, we're really getting quite good at it, and it's going to be frightening when I show you here in a little bit about how good we are at growing it. Now this this is a picture of what we thought was Palmer, and I, I told you because it has watermarks on it, that's one of the key identifying characteristics. But this was a seedling, so we couldn't look at the petioles to see that it, you know, that they were long, the, the leaf stems, 
and myself and another uh, weed scientist, we were we were convinced that we had a whole field and a cornfield of, of this. And it happened to be after it was tested, we sent it to a DNA lab. This was before uh, it was identified in Benson County. And anyway, we sent it down. It came back to be uh, hollow amaranth, which is still problematic. And if you've just got a few of those in your field, it'd be best just to pull them. They're a real hassle in dry bean production, especially uh, in a dry bean, small grain rotations. You don't want to let your seeds build up because many of the herbicides aren't as effective. Well, they're not very effective at all because they don't touch it. So we've got some resistance issues, uh, but it's just another one of the big, big weed species. This one is self-pollinated, meaning it doesn't take pollen from another plant to fertilize it. So the genetic diversity doesn't change quite as quickly, but it has been problematic in areas of the state. Here's just a picture that that's, this is Paul Amaranth. And that's my old dog Bones there. He was out with me looking for weeds. Uh, but you can see how prolific of the seed producer these can be too. And there again, if you just have a few of these in, in your, in your uh, field, by all means, take care of it early on before you have to fight another lead with some potential resistance. A grower called me uh, a few years ago and said, hey, I think I got Palmer Amaranth in there. He sent me some close-up pictures and we, we looked at it. We, we were able, able to identify a few hairs, not a lot. And where the hairs were, were up on the upper growing point on the stem. They don't, they're not really hairy, but they, they, they can have a few, and that's one of the, it had hair, so we knew it wasn't palmer or water hemp. Both of them will not have any hairs on it. But he said, well, what should I do with it? I said, well, it was my field, and I only had one or two out there. I'd get them out of there, so I wasn't starting to, you know, get a, a big seed bank of these in my field, because I've seen, uh, especially dry beans, taken over by Powell amaranth and water hemp, and you, you couldn't even see what, what was what was growing in there. They were so dense in many portions of the field. Now this is uh, a new map that, that was put together, and this shows the states that have had Palmer Amaranth. And we're up to 19 now, and at any rate, they've been there. All of those counties still do not have it. Some were eradicated in full, and that's why it's really important to jump on this quick if it's identified in your field, to shut it down before it goes to seed if, if you can. And here's water hemp distribution. I think there's 34 counties here, and it's rapidly spreading from the east to the west. Um, it loves water, sloughs, any drainages, lake shores and such. Uh, two years or a couple of years ago, we had all that spring flooding. Well, that was last year. Imagine how many seeds floated around like corks and were distributed into any, any annual stream. They were moving uh, many miles, and we wouldn't have even known. And then also in in the winter now, if there was a plant on a fence line or on a rock pile or something, and it's shaking, rattling, and rolling, imagine how far those seeds can go on a windy day in a frozen tundra. This this was a field in Benson County a few years ago. Obviously, it's a it's a wheat crop, and you can it's a little hard to tell, but you can see just a couple of plants out there. That's the time that you want to be very vigilant and not just run on through the combine and, and spread it throughout because there again, these things are very, very heavy seed producers. And if you can get, catch them like this before they go to seed, you're gonna be very, time very well spent and money saved. That's when we wanna find it. From, from a couple of these plants here, here, here like that, within three years, you'll have solid distribution across the field if, if things don't go right at, at all with your, with your herbicides and such and rotations also play a big part in that, but that's how quick it blows up. Now here's some more Benson County action. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's along a seed handling area. And many times these rail cars come and they got five bushels of, you know, discarded crop in there. Why they didn't empty them all the way out, I don't know. But before they load these cars up, you know, they're not going to contaminate putting barley in there or something if it's half, got, you know, a few bushels of weed in there. So it's no wonder these that, that these are showing up in some of these facilities where they handle handle grain. And um, I, I, I asked the individual what he sprayed here, and he said a high rate of Roundup. Notice all of these, all of these 
mainly these are red rick bigweed. It just smoked and killed them. Uh, and here's here's a female water hemp. Uh, it hadn't gone to seed yet. I was able to pull it out of there, but those, those herbicides didn't touch it. A high rate of banvil didn't even touch it. And we're seeing some more resistant issues with some of the banvil uh, products too and some other weeds. Um, but had that not been pulled, it would have went to seed and just been another source uh, for somebody else. And those were the, you know, they, they were treated at about a foot, foot and a half tall. And I, I'm guessing sometime in August, and I just, I wonder if he's got any seeds in it, whether it be any of the big weeds, when they get like that, that late in the year, do you think this herbicide treatment that killed that plant shut it down from making seed? Not very much at all. I, I was told 10 days after they become pollinated, those seeds are viable. They might not have longevity to, to, to be viable uh, for years, but until they get a hard seed coat, then it takes quite a few years to uh, have them diminish their viability or germination potential. Here's some more Benson County stuff. I walked out here and it was like, holy cow, back in the hippie days, uh, fluorescent uh, water hemp. And, I was just, they're just purple as can be. And I, I talked to Joe Eichley, our lead scientist on NSU, and he said there's, you know, a small portion of the population that has this purple pinkish color. But this was a wheat field. I could, I could, anyway, the neighbor saw it. We had some experience with it before, and he asked me to go out and look, and I did. And I found way more than I wanted to. I called the grower and said, we've got a, you've got a lot of water hemp out there. And, you know, he was busy farming and stuff. He said, yeah, I'll get to it. Well, he got to it later, but it had already gone to seed. And I did submit some, some seed to uh, NDSU to have it grown out and just see what kind of herbicide resistant package it might already have when it got here. But I'm pretty convinced this, this farming operation more than likely got some of these in their plants because there were a few here out in the wheat. And he probably did a good job of spreading them across his farm with the next field he went to. And obviously all these slough areas, they, they made a lot of seed and he's gonna be dealing this for some time. It was modeled with sloughs and things. So as that water moves in there and moves this spring, we could have a lot of seed move it to other, his neighbors. And that, that's what's, uh, you know, it, it's it, everybody, it's everybody's job to work on this together. There ain't no hiding this. If you haven't got a few, it's always best to talk to your neighbors and get up to speed to what they look like. There, there's another one you can see that that, that is a, that is a water hemp and it's a female. Again, very narrow, kind of dense seed structures. And there again, you can see that that leaf, that kind of longer leaf versus the short fat ones in the long petiole on a palmer amber. Here's good old palmer, two, 222, Benson County, grew it ourselves. Uh, I got there before it went to seed and I, and I did pull it. I only found a couple plants right in one spot. But I would say there's probably a, a bit of a seed bank at this in this area. So it's it's been monitored now for four, four or five years. And they're they're trying to contain it and do the best we can, but it just keeps coming back to the longevity of that seed. This one was really disturbing. This this individual knows he's got water hemp. And this is in a portion of Benson County. His neighbors are concerned. Uh, this is soybeans. It was harvested with the combine. There was no going around anything out here. I actually drove by the day it was being harvested. But see these streaks in here? That was probably from last year's harvesting when the combine went through and the, the uh, spreader spread the, the seed out behind it. And we saw this in Nebraska on that trip. And I've seen it with other weed species too. It's a very good disseminator. And the front of this field is just loaded with full grown uh, water hemp. And this guy's gonna be dealing this for quite a few years. And right so he's got his neighbors a little concerned about uh, whether it be rotations or lack of trying to do something. But this isn't the only spot. It's 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 just, I guess, a matter of time before it, it gets to more places. But if you're the more vigilant you are, you're going to be money ahead. Here's more. Uh, I, I just I, I just uh, I just shake my head when I see this. But, you know, not everybody knows what it looks like. And we thought we started educating people on the, what this looks like in 2017. We were thinking, oh, we're good county agents. We'll go tell everybody what it looks like. They'll know. Well, some know, 
And I'm getting a lot of pictures of stuff that doesn't even resemble uh, Palmer Amaranth or water hemp, and that's okay. But at least we're looking and guys are paying attention. But if there again, if you see something that, that's looking goofy with them big, big old seed heads on it, make sure you get a hold of your, uh, your uh, agronomist or your county extension office. Yeah, uh, here's just just some more. See how prolific it is. Uh, this one is in Ramsey County. It's been there for a couple of years. The landlord is is concerned with it. The grower doesn't seem to be so concerned with it. And all the low spots in the sloughs, there's been a steady increase in population. And my guess is this particular grower, maybe unwillingly, has probably got this all over his uh, his farm ground. And of course, there's ditches and it can move to adjacent fields. So concerning, and like I said, it's a group effort. And there's nobody, you didn't go plant this there yourself. I don't want anybody to feel ashamed of, of saying you got it because it's, it's just what happens. Could have been a bird that, that dumped it there or a goose or a combine or a four wheeler or tire. That was just a picture the first year we found it in Benson County. I just stumbled across it and went out there and the guys have been doing a very vigilant job with roguing and, and pulling. And uh, I fortunately I caught this before all this stuff went to seed. We were out in another field along the tracks again, soybean field. The guy was coming there in within a day or two. This is his next field to harvest. And and I saw all these these pigweed plants. And I mean not big, yeah, big weeds, uh, water hemp, thousands of them, you know, chin high or, or better. Anyway, we were, what are we going to do here? So we started pulling weeds and we're going to try to burn them or destroy them right there in the field. Uh, the seed, the seed was there. I don't know how good it was. We did, but what the grower did not do was run his combine right where all those weeds were and spread it on his, on his farm. And I, before we left the field, I suggested to the couple of the young men on the farm operation and the and grandpa that we need to look at our soles of our shoes and such to make sure we didn't carry any weed seed. And anyway, I looked in the bottom of my sketchers. There I go. I got quite a bit of weed seeds in my shoe. And you know, who would have thought of that? But you need to be vigilant and, and think of any any method that it can be transported. That's that's the way it can move. This, this was the field along the tracks that we were trying to deal with all the way along there, just a strip uh, along the soybean field. And that was a couple of years. And I think I got a slide here. This, this is what they used the next year after that, all that water hemp in there was uh, some of the, the herbicides that they used in the wheat. And in 220 or 21, it was super dry, just dry as, as all get out. But they put on sharpen as a pre plant. And then in the season, they used Husky Complete. And then, you know, started in August, then the rains turned on, and then we got some germination of some of these pigweeds, and they came back with the dicamba 2,4-D, and they burnt it down before harvest. And I went out, I went out in that, that field. I, you know, we went from this to a wheat field that you couldn't hardly find any plants in. I'm sure there's still a seed bank there. There was a, a few low spots, the sloughs and things, had a few plants in. But I was pretty pleased, and so was the grower, that he was able to contain it. But all it takes is one year, one blow up like that, and you you got it all over the place. Yeah. So this is this is a, a field in Nebraska in 2017. We were there. You think some of those pictures I showed you, some of some of what they have there, are resembling what what we're coming upon in isolated cases? It's it's here and. I don't know that we can stop it. We can slow it down, uh, but it's it's a, it's it's a fright. Um, it sometimes it can be distributed in, in the seed. There was a seed bot a couple of years ago. Some millet there was some contamination, and you can see you know if you were driving by, you you probably see that that plant there, that palmer. And uh, but can you see this one right here? So these windshield drive-bys, you know, they work a little bit, but once you see it and it, it starts to get that big. Uh, so be diligent with your, your field scouting and I'm sure your agronomists are aware of it in the area and they're, they're keeping a close eye, but it doesn't hurt to have little Johnny or Susie or mom know what these look like too. Everybody on the operation should know how to identify them or at least be in the know that we need to ask some questions 
and, and get an answer. This one got to uh, over by Oberon here a few years ago. Uh, agronomist called me in the drawer. He found this in a sunflower field where they had uh, planted, well, planted sunflowers. Uh, early on in, the, in the, the spring, there was water there in the low, in this slough, and, and the thing just just blew up to water him. And we went in there, and thankfully it was caught. Even though those plants were that big, there wasn't viable seed in it yet. And we pulled, well, we pulled a lot and got him out of there. And uh, that's what some of the stumps look like. That's that's Benson County uh, water him right there. Uh, we were gonna. We thought we'd put them all in this this shuttle, this tote, whatever you call it, herbicide container. We took a couple of plants in there, and the thing was about full. That's they were like Christmas tree. Uh, so the, the, the individual grower, he took that down the road. I don't know if he took it to a burn pit or what. In hindsight, I would have said, you you, you bury them or, or burn them or destroy them right in this field. Why take the chance of bouncing down the road with that trailer? If you have any of those that have viable seed in, you're going to be like a salt and pepper shaker going down the street shaking them out but fortunately he doesn't have them over there anymore that i've heard of and i checked with him but that's how easy it can blow up and i, I believe that was by a waterfall in the spring migration and of course we hear about spreading in bales and things like that there's some growing right in the eaves gutter there might have been burned up there dropped some seed going right in the trap they're really a survivor of course equipment uh, can have it sometimes. This was a, a, a soybean field, 300 acres. Uh, this was the first year that we found Palmer in North Dakota, and it just sent out an email to the growers, and we came there that morning, and we had 25, 30 guys there, including some agronomists and stuff, and we walked this, this soybean field with 55-gallon bags and filled them up, and these growers continue to do that and I myself went back out there and, oh, God, they just kept coming out of those soybeans. That's the problematic thing with soybeans or corn. It's a long season crop, and you're not getting it out of there early. So the, the chances of some of this going to seed are much greater with some of those long season crops. But what, what was interesting here, there was sloughs here, here, and this water movement came here. And this edge, there was water hemp and some palmer. We got to here, and, man, it was all over here. So it kind of told me that uh, water had moved, been very good at dispersing the, this, this seed bank. And these guys are doing a good job trying to stay on top of it. But he feels that like three years prior to this, he had, he had a custom combine come in and he thinks that may be where it got started. Nobody nobody knows for sure, but uh, that that was one, that, that, that seems to be a, a theme sometimes. Knowing when they emerge, the problem with these water hemp and uh, down here, well into July, and I think they'll even germinate more than that. And I know Palmer Amaranth will be trying to make seed out here in August. I've seen plants, and I'll show you a picture in, in August, uh, that the, the bottom of the cornfield was just loaded with it. So an extra tillage pass sometimes in the spring might, might help a little bit. And I know every operation is different. You might have some minimum till, no till and stuff, but I think we're gonna be forced to change the way we operate a little bit. So knowing some of the biology of, of our plants certainly helps. Well, this was at Cornfield. This was in Nebraska that year we took. The agronomist down there, Jody Sapworth, sent me this picture. And they don't, this, these plants, I think this was Palmer, well, they called them just pigweeds, like I said earlier. But it, it doesn't need direct sunlight. And he told me by September, these plants will be about two, three inches tall, and they'll have an inch long seed head. They're not producing a lot of seed, but they're a survivor, and they will, like all weeds. It's, it's tough to beat Mother Nature. Uh, how long do they last on the soil surface? We've still got 5% of them. The Palmer, 5% of water hemp, and 5% doesn't really sound like that much until you start thinking about what's 5% of uh, 250,000 seeds or a half a million seeds. It's plenty. Okay, down south, uh, I, I've been told by folks they don't have herbicides to control some of these anymore in soybeans and corn. They become resistant to it. So what do they do then? They, they got some hand labor out there. In one year, they pulled plants, and it took them 110 hours. And I don't know how big the field was, but obviously they spent a lot of time there hand-roading weeds. The following year, they spent five hours. 
and then the next year, two hours. So this, this gives me a little hope that maybe we can remedy a situation if it's just not, if we don't have it, it's zillion, a, a billion of them out there. Uh, but do we have the, the hand labor? Heck, you can't even get somebody to go to McDonald's and buy a hamburger or go to a checkout counter sometimes. Or where are we going to get the workforce to, to go pull these weeds? And I've done a lot of it. it well, it's hard work and it's not any fun, but so it's concerning to say the least. But to me, this is a this is a success story. Uh, I don't know what happened. Thirteen, maybe. Okay, we always talk about spray coverings, and I heard a talk earlier about Liberty. You got to have humidity to make this work. The Liberty label says uh, two inches tall. We get weathered out. And anyway, this was in Nebraska again, and it was in some plots. And uh, is that is that big weed look dead to you? Looks like probably a contact dried dried off the uh, the foliage and stuff. Uh, we got down and looked at it closer, and all these auxiliary and all the leaf actual that was starting to produce growth. And if they grow two inches, two two inches a day, it's not going to take very long to get big enough. And we saw some plants down there that got ran over by tractors and cut off with pop can sized stumps, and they were sending up arms like pool cues full of seed or ready to go to seed. It was just amazing the tenacity these have. This is Blue Bosnate or Liberty. The, the deal I want to talk on this slide is there's 30% control. That's at the half rate. Uh, a full rate down there, and this is, yeah, Liberty. They still had 15 or so percent, so they have resistance there. Uh, and it could have been coverage or something like that, too, but half rates don't cut it with this weed. You need to throw the kitchen sink at it. And here's just a perfect example of resistance in your field. One weed is just dead, toasted, and you got another one here that got gnarled and buggered up. They're probably able to go ahead and make seed. Uh, here's another one with dicamber resistance, half rate with the black, large across there, 30, 35% control only. Now, I guess this is water hemp here. And then here's a full rate. It was quite a bit better, but that's concerning when we see resistance escapes that high in a field, obviously. There, it, you can see where it dinged it up and it, it was able to survive and more than likely could have produced seed. This was uh, Benson County. I was coming across the lake home one day. Uh, at any rate, I, I saw just what we saw in, in Nebraska and I saw these strips and I go, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? We got, now we got Palmer and water here. I went out there and there it was Powell and red red pigweed, but I'm not exactly sure if this was distributed by the combine or somebody said earlier they had some bad sweeps on, on one of their implements and that made a difference in weed control or if there were skips with the sprayers, some booms, uh, some nozzles plugged. But anyway, I went out there and it was it was just good old red red pig weed if that's a good a good weed to him. Versus Palmer and water hemp, it is a good weed to him. We always talk about uh, you know, field borders, rock piles, telephone poles. One thing I would I would like to say is let the grass grow there. Let your grow them. Let your let your quack grow on that spot because it's competitive against establishment of all these other weeds. You go through there with a roundup or your herbicides, hang the boom over, whether it be a road ditch, you want you want you want some competition there from those grasses. They will help you out immensely. And this is just a free-for-all seed factory here with everything. And I, I know it's it happens all over, and it's just it's just a thing to keep in mind that that grass there can be your friend and serve as competition for some of these weeds. Here I talked about the competition. 20% uh, with just one plant for six, six and a half foot a roll. Here's one in soybeans, 17% yield reduction with one plant for 10 foot a roll. I saw I saw fields like Hills by Hillsboro. I headed over to Minnesota. There were sunflowers over there that looked like this with this stuff blowing right up through the canopy. And so they're they're having a they're dealing with it. They're not they weren't able to control it. And you can bet your dollar it, it went to seed. So they're in it in it for the long haul. And it's hopefully it's I hopefully it doesn't get that bad here soon. But I, I I'm uh, kind of leery of it. Um 
No, there was a common denominator, and I know some things have been changed with some of the, the, the meal and stuff that folks feed livestock in the sunflower industry. They were made aware of it and are doing some things to uh, and, and sampling their product before it goes out so they're not selling uh, pigweed seeds. But sometimes uh, it comes in millet. One year there was millet all over the place that they had a contaminated seed lot. There was even a CRP grass mix one year that had it across the country because it was contaminated. So we're getting better at looking at that. I don't know all the all the rules and regs of it, but uh, the other the other four counties had equipment. We think it was spread by in rail. Th these numbers are, are going to be up a bit here, especially by rail and 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 some of these equipment that it's that it's being spread. So, so we, we took some samples in, Brian, uh, Joe Eichley asked for some seeds from around to get submitted for resistance. This is what we found in, in Benson County. With this only one population I submitted, or one of them, uh, 240D and Flexstar killed all of them. Husky worked well, but it didn't get them all. Uh, Dicamba and Liberty more survived and died at a three inch application. And that, that's kind of scary. Obviously, the smaller plants can get better control. And now this was Homer Amaranth, Dicamba, with these populations that were sent down there and tested, killed them all. Uh, Flexstar, 75% kill. That isn't good enough. And of course, you wouldn't expect to get good control at two and a half foot plants, but Husky, uh, it, it didn't get any control with those big plants. But on the small ones, it, it worked. It worked quite well. About going over. Anyway, a cheap program without some of these, uh, I think those are days maybe gone by where we don't have problematic weeds. If you're going aggressively up in Palmer, uh, the, the price just keeps going up. And, and here's some more figures, and Joe Ike put this together. But anyway, the bottom line, when you start going after these, these heavy big weeds, two and a half to three times increase in weed control cost. Hear a new word, old new word today. Fascination. That's just a genetic, genetic mutation. And this was on a water hemp. I saw it and I go, well, that baby must have got a whiff of a growth regulator herbicide. Look at how wide and fat it was. And I've also seen this in kosher, but it's, it's just a genetic mutation. I thought I really found something cool. Well, it was kind of cool. But uh, that's all I got. Uh, if you got questions, I'll be around here. Um,